Perfect. Um, so first and foremost, uh, thank you for joining us for this session. Um, so I'm Lynn McDonald. I'm an engineer and manager at UK Power Network's Smart Grids team. Uh, for those that don't know UK Power Networks, we own, manage and operate um, the electricity infrastructure in London, the South East and East of England, serving 18 million people and delivering their electricity, which represents 28% of the UK's population. But enough about me, I'd like to kick off the session at innovation in the energy space. So for context, the energy system is going through fundamental change. We view, and hopefully you would agree with us, that the world of energy is going through exciting times. The way that we produce, distribute and consume electricity is transforming in front of our eyes. Advancements in technology are shaping and impacting people's lives already and will continue to do so. In the future, in the coming years, people will be using electrical vehicles and driverless cars. They'll be using smart appliances within their home and they will also be storing and selling their electricity. Furthermore, they'll be engaging with the energy market in a very different way. They'll be able to manage their energy through remote systems and through voice activation using app-based products and voice assistants and virtual assistants. So to give you just a bit of a perspective, here is a day in the life story of Sally. And this is whereby she's on the journey to the future of energy. In that short glimpse that you saw of a day in the life of Sally, albeit it was just her morning start, is what our customers and communities are asking of the energy industry is very much, they're asking for us to facilitate them going about their day to life and business in an easy, convenient manner. They don't want to understand or care where the energy is coming from. They want to ensure it's there when they need it to go about their day. And they want that done in an affordable and efficient manner. So it's important that the energy industry ensures that we continue to innovate, basically evolve and collaborate to ensure that the a day in the life stories of customers, communities and you in this room become a reality. And this will ensure that the decarbonisation of the energy system is delivered at least cost, as highlighted in an important report last year by Imperial College London, that this smart, new, brave energy world can be delivered 17 to 40 billion pounds cheaper if we move to a smart, flexible energy system. So an important question for the energy industry is how are we innovating and facilitating the low carbon transition and empowering the customer to take advantage of the technologies available now and for those in the future. 
So I've got with me two experts and two individuals that represent organizations that are active in the energy industry. Um, one is Daniel Kirk, who's standing. Daniel Kirk is the head of Offgem's Innovation Link service. And I also have with me Randolph Brazier, the head of Innovations and Development at the Energy Networks Association. So what I'll first do is I'll ask each of them to come up, highlight who their organization is, and what they're doing as a business in innovating in the energy space. And then we'll go into a Q&A session and open up for questions from the audience. So I work for the energy regulator Ofgem, and one of the things that we wanted to be really sure of is that we were part of the solution to helping people innovate rather than being a barrier to innovation. Because for us it was really obvious that our job is to protect consumers, our job is to make sure that the lights stay on, and our job is to make sure that the energy supply is sustainable. And you can't have all of those things unless you have some innovation. So we wanted to make sure we support innovation. And what happened is about a year ago, we set up the Innovation Link. And that team, my team within Ofgem, are responsible for working with people who want to innovate within the energy sector and making sure that they're able to do that. And in order to do that, we provide two services. A feedback service where anyone can come to us and ask us uh, how they can go ahead with their new product, new service, new business model, and we'll provide them advice on how you navigate through the regulation. And we also offer a regulatory sandbox. And the purpose of the sandbox is that if someone discovers that there is actually a regulatory barrier to them going ahead with their innovation, there's something, and it's not normally that the, that the regulation was designed to stop what they're trying to do, it's that the regulation was written without having the particular idea in mind, and it's accidentally stopping something that would now be a good product, a good service for consumers. And so what we can do in that case is look to give them a sandbox which means for the purposes of a trial, that they can go ahead and we'll lighten the regulation for them. So our service being just over a year old and, f uh, and really started just as an experiment to see if anyone would come to us and if we could provide some value to them, is still evolving. And so one of the reasons it's exciting to be here speaking to you is because maybe amongst you there are people who are looking to do new things in the energy space and if the service we provide isn't something that fits what you need, then we're very happy to have a conversation because I don't imagine that in a few years' time, what we'll be doing looks like what we're doing now. And the more we can learn about who's out there, what they're trying to do, and what support they need, the better job we can do. So that's where you'll find us, and I'll be around afterwards if anyone wants to have a chat. Okay, hey everyone, my name's Randolph. And I work for the Energy Networks Association. And who we are, we represent all of the gas and electricity utilities, so essentially the wires and pipes in the UK and Ireland. So on the left here, we've got the gas distribution and transmission companies. And on the, on the right there, we've got the electricity equivalent. So these are essentially the, the high and low pressure and high and, high and low voltage networks that transfer the energy from generators to, to us as end users. So as you can see, we pretty much cover every uh, customer in the UK and Ireland. So what, what, why are the networks innovating? Uh, you know, what, why would we innovate? And the simple question is, uh, the simple answer is that we want to move towards the smart grid because of decentralization, digitization, and decarbonization. We, at the moment, so much change is happening and there's so much uncertainty that the networks don't know what the final smart grid looks like. So we very much need to run innovation projects and innovation trials, learn, essentially learn by doing, so that we can make that transition. So at ENA, um, we, we basically work with our members who get innovation funding from, from Ofgem. Is that, is that better? Okay. Uh, so we work with uh, um, our members um, we get innovation funding from Ofgem, the Network Innovation Allowance and the Network Innovation Competition. We work with our members to determine what projects we need to run so that we can make that transition. And we, we work with our members to collaborate, work on projects together, share learnings so that we're not essentially wasting taxpayers' money. And 
ultimately this has driven a lot of benefits. We, uh, a report was released where the benefits achieved from innovation projects were about three times what the actual cost of them was in the first place. Um, so we, we do this and we put all of the projects on uh, our Smarter Networks portal. This is the page here, the link is on the next page, next slide. All of the innovation projects that any of the networks have ever run since 2004, which is when the funding started, are held on that portal. And then on the, the bottom portal there, the Network Innovation Collaboration Portal, this is where we want industry to tell us what their new technology is, what their new app is, what their new innovation is, put it into the portal, that'll go to the networks and then we might apply to get funding to trial your solution. So it's a way that people can get involved in innovation in the networks rather than just having the networks do it themselves. So that's all I really wanted to say. The links there, uh, the links to those two portals are there and, and my email's there as well. So what we'll do is we'll now break into the panel discussion. So I think probably just to kick off, I think to a question both to Randolph and Daniel is clearly there's a lot of innovation activity and evolution occurring and I think probably a question that some of us may ask is what is this activity leading to? Is there a goal in mind that, that basically you're all working towards? Thank you. So, so far for us, as I say, we're just over a year old and we've already spoken to more than 150 innovators who have got support from us one way or the other. So in terms of what this is leading to, we still have a little bit more to go in terms of our service, understanding what new products and services they'll come up with. But I think what's really obvious is that people are saying that they have been able to go ahead with things that they didn't know that they were able to do and they expected actually to have more barriers to innovation than they, than they actually encountered. So I think that's the impact we've seen so far. I think if, if you take this. It's not working. Um, uh, the ultimate goal of, of the networks is to transition the networks to a smart grid. And that smart grid will be essentially, like I said, a, de a completely decarbonised grid, a decentralised grid, so where most of the generation has moved from those traditional large central sources to generation in the home, for example, or in local businesses. And it'll also be one that's digitised, so there'll be much more visibility of what's happening with the network and how much energy you're using and selling so that ultimately people can save money. And it probably. For those maybe in the audience, I can only guess whom you are, but if some of the audience members have ideas, and also but looking at the energy sector, what opportunities do you foresee for new building innovators, new disruptors within the construction industry? So Randolph, if you can kick off. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Uh, so basically, I, I would see this as a massive opportunity to add a new, essentially a new value stream to your business. So whether that's by producing and storing your own power, for example, or it might be providing new services to the networks, for example, demand-side response. Uh, it could also be, in, in the future, peer-to-peer -peer trading. So trading energy with your local community or, or your neighbours, for example. So I see that the big opportunity is for you to basically lower your bills and add a new value stream to your businesses. I think you've nailed it. I can only second that. Yeah. And then, for example, what value has the consumer seen to date from the innovation activity within the energy sector? And what can they expect to see? Daniel, if you kick off. Sure. So, so for us personally as a service, it's early days, as I say, but I think you're already seeing that, that bills are lower than they would have been had we not seen innovation. Um, what do you think, Randolph? Yeah, so from the last five years of innovation funding, the benefits for the companies that have implemented those projects is around about a billion pounds and the initial cost, like I said earlier, was around about a third of that. And if all of our networks it roll out those innovations, the benefits of the projects that have happened to date could be up to around 8.1 billion pounds. And that's, that's just the monetary value. From a carbon perspective, I think that it's something like 215 million tonnes of carbon have been saved, which as I read today was about, is about the size of two UK sized forests. Uh, looking forward, if we move towards that fully flexible network that Lynn was talking about, the, the studies that Imperial College, and uh, which was commissioned by Ofgem, uh, has shown is that the, the, the future benefits could be between 17 and 40 billion pounds uh, across the energy industry. Mm -hmm. 
And looking, moving forward, so for these new innovators, you highlighted it's accessible, but how will you ensure that, that it's not always the likely suspects that are innovating and partnering up with the network businesses and that we're allowing new disruptors to break in and look at new commercial models and, and ways of doing items? So this is a big part of what we're all about um, because absolutely we're open to everyone and it's really good to see that loads of the people who are coming to us about new products, new services, are not the usual suspects. We absolutely do hear from big incumbents in the energy industry who are wanting to try something new. We also hear from tiny players who have just had very recent ideas. We have had people who come out of universities and we've had people that we really didn't expect from large companies that are not in the energy sector and are looking to come in. Uh, so I think we will see lots of really interesting and different organizations coming into the sector over the coming years. Yeah, and, and from the network's perspective, that's exactly why we set up that innovation portal. We want people to pitch ideas at us, but now that we, we realise that we even need to take a more active role, so that's why we come to events like this. We're trying to reach out to those people that we don't usually hear from and get them involved in this transition because there's real value to be, to be gained here for your businesses. And just thinking about maybe to give a perspective to the audience, obviously there's been a, a buoyant innovation activity in the last few years. Is there any standout innovations that you think are maybe quite practical for consumer benefits and consumer benefits and within the construction world that you might want to spotlight? Yeah, I can. So I think one of the ones that we we uh, I think <laughs> one of the ones that, that we've seen come through our sandbox is is looking at uh, taking solar panels that are on the roof of, of a council estate down at and Castle and looking at, at selling the power that's being generated on the roof to the people in those in those flats and uh, all of these projects are just starting to kick off but I think that we will start to see people being able to get access to cheaper power more green power than they were able to before because of these projects I think from my perspective Sort of, we've seen people, you know, they're getting CHPs, getting solar panels, getting renewables. I think the new technology that's going to be a big part of the, the future system is storage. So it's adding storage to your businesses. But then with that storage, apart from doing, you know, the usual buying and selling of power, as Daniel just mentioned, it's on top of that, adding services to the network, so selling services to the network, whether it's frequency response, voltage support, so it's, sta it's stacking value on top of your existing assets, that is where the future innovation should be heading because that's where the value is. And looking at new housing developments and the refurbishment of existing building infrastructure, what new specific markets do you think are being opened up to that particular stakeholder group at the moment in the energy industry? Sorry, try that on me again. So this is whereby the moment with the new housing and buildings and the developments with a lot of residential demand and then looking at current refurbishment builds, particularly looking at London, for example, in the city, what specific new markets is open to a new developer or someone that's refurbishing and looking at energy efficiency? Yeah, I guess, I guess it's, it's partly energy efficiency, which some of our members are starting looking at, helping people understand how to make their energy usage more efficient. But I guess with refurbishments, it's also, as well, in the future, it's going to be decarbonisation of heat. So whether that's electrifying your heat or using hydrogen or something like that in the future, I think that's where it's headed. Yeah, it's perhaps also worth adding that, that we get uh, a few questions recently about people looking to speak to energy suppliers who have an obligation to deliver uh, energy efficiency and that there are, is funding available through that mechanism, it's called the ECO, the Energy Company Obligation. So in, ter in terms of opportunities, some of them also involve tapping into subsidies or, or required spending that's already out there. Mm -hmm. And probably in the context we've highlighted for the future of energy and in looking at building urban um, areas, for example, clearly that requires increased collaboration and, re and forging new relationships between cross sectors. So have you got a view of what that could develop into or any examples of that currently in play? Yeah, I, I mean, from the perspective of innovation funding, part of the off-gem rules for, for getting that funding is that 75% of that has to go to third parties, whether that's contractors, academia, technology providers. So 
all of our innovation projects are with, with different partners from across the energy industry. But going forward, it's going to be understanding, for example, how does a community interact with the network? So how does a community, if they want to all chip in and buy uh, a wind turbine, for example, and add some storage with it, how can we work with them to help drive value for them and essentially have them be self-sufficient while still connecting to the network? And I think you see, I think the collaboration point is a really good one because I think you see across so many sectors far beyond our own that you get the most interesting things happening at the edges between disciplines and where you get very different players to coming together. So the project I mentioned earlier is a collaboration between a university, a local community group, a non-profit and, and an existing energy supplier. And we see that more and more and I think it's really heartening to see when you get people where the collaboration potential is not necessarily obvious, but they found that there is in fact something that they can do together that they can't do separately. Um, and so I think we'll see far more of that. And I think already you see, for example, people taking things like blockchain, as you mentioned earlier, that people were finding applications for in financial services. And suddenly, and I think we're a couple of years behind where there are in financial services, realizing that there are perhaps applications in the energy sector and then bringing some of that expertise and knowledge across to do things that, that I hadn't really thought possible. Yeah. The other thing I, I forgot to mention is that part of that study that Imperial College did, it, it showed that actually the most benefits from this, this transition that we're undertaking uh, occur when you, when you take a whole system perspective. So traditionally energy has been split up into electricity, gas, heat, transport. What we need to do going forward is take a whole systems approach, understand how all these things interact and work together. So that's actually something for third parties that we're really interested in learning more about because we're only just touching the surface. How can uh, your innovation take a whole energy systems approach and work with other energy vectors in particular um, to, to basically help us make this transition in the most effective and beneficial way? And just thinking maybe for the audience, if they're sitting there with maybe a new technology, something that can support the efficiency of buildings, for 2018 to 2023, what would you say is the top three challenges and opportunities of the networks that actually we're opening up asking for disruptors to come and support us shaping the smart grids? Yeah, I, go to, I think uh, the, fir well, the first challenge or biggest challenge and but also a massive opportunity is electric vehicles. Electric vehicles could potentially add a huge load to the electricity networks but equally, it could be a massive opportunity with things like vehicle to grid technology, which is where your car generates power back into the grid. I'd say the second one is how on earth we're gonna decarbonize heat, uh, heat and, and gas. So electricity's doing okay, around about the 20 to 25% decarbonized level. Gas is at about one or 2%. So that's a huge challenge, how we're gonna decarbonize gas and there's a lot of options, biogas, hydrogen, those sorts of technologies. And then I think the third, I think it's definitely an opportunity personally, is smart meters. So the rollout of smart meters, which the government um, has enforced, everyone should have one or two smart meters by 2020. That's gonna be a massive opportunity because A, it'll help the networks get better visibility of you know, what's actually happening at those lower voltages, but B, from a consumer perspective, it will enable you to understand how you're using your energy, and how you can reduce it, and how you can make more money from it. So I think you've done a really good job of bringing out some of the exciting areas that people may have ideas around. And also, look, I really like my job. I haven't been doing it very long, and it's still very exciting to me. And one of the things that, that makes it so exciting is that people come to me pretty regularly with something where I haven't even realized that there was something that you could do in that area. And sometimes it's in an area like one of the ones that you've mentioned, where I thought, yeah, this is obviously important, and we obviously need things to come forward in this area. And sometimes it delivers a benefit that's an obvious benefit that I didn't even realize was sitting there waiting for someone to take advantage of. So we try really hard not to pick winners and not to, make a, a, not to try and say, here, everybody, we're all going this way and either come with us or not. What we try and say is, you tell us what you think you can do and let us try and get out of the way and help you do something. If it's good for current and future consumers, then fantastic. How can we support you? 
And, and then clearly at a time of unprecedented change, collaboration is vital. But obviously we want to fast follow others. So obviously taking examples of nationally, but both internationally. So how are the energy sector organisations looking beyond our own geographies and borders? And how will that be continued over the years to come? So if you want to start, Randolph. Yeah, so um, at, at the ENA, um, we also sit on the equivalent projects and working groups in Europe. So we take learnings from all, all of the European countries and, and some of them are ahead in some areas and, and in other areas the UK is ahead. But we take a lot of learnings from them um, and, and essentially fast follow as Lynn's uh, mentioned, particularly on things like new flexibility markets and things like that. But also we do quite a lot of work because I think almost all of our members are owned by uh, an overseas company, at least part owned. So we take learnings from their, you know, the companies that are also under their umbrella, which are typically in the US and, and Australia as well. So I think there's two interesting things going on. I think firstly, the global community of innovators is a global community that people are very naturally looking to other countries and, and going to conferences. I was an, an innovator called Verve this morning. The guy had to run out after, after he was speaking to me to go to a con, uh, conference in Austin. So I think in that regard, it's not so much for, for us to look at, uh, abroad as it is for, for innovators to look all around the world and then to bring the latest ideas into this country and for us, as I say, to help support where we can. But the other conversation that goes on is how can we as a regulator, as an industry body, how can we make sure that we're learning in the best way possible? And one of the things, one of the surprising and delightful things that seems to be happening to me at the moment is I get calls from governments from around the world who want to have a chat and have heard about what we're doing and are interested in learning from it. And I hope that we'll continue to have two-way conversations where we find out what other organizations, what other countries are doing, and how we can take anything good that they're doing and make sure that, that if they're doing something sensible, we do the same. Where do you see... Where do you see sorry, we've got it working. So where do you see at the moment, obviously there's a lot of innovators, so fletching is sort of innovators that are trying to work their way through the energy industry. Where would you first point them to and what would be your top few tips in advising them to bring their idea to the energy industry for review and then springboarding that to value and impact for the customers? So it's always, an, I've worked with innovators for a lot of years and it's always an interesting question as to where you, where you start. One of the things I'd say is that a lot of people uh, have assumptions about how their customers will behave and it's very useful the earlier that you can get out and start having contact with customers so as to check that where you're going is a way that is useful to them and that there is a demand for the thing that you're trying to do but that's just me speaking personally the other thing that I can say um, more for, from a, a work point of view is that th it, there's a load of good material out there on the Ofgem website, on the National Grid website, in loads of other places where you can start learning about the sector. And then once you've done some of that initial research, we're really happy to have a chat at the innovation link uh, about the product, the service that you're trying to bring out and how we can help you move it forward. But it's usually useful if you started to have those initial conversations with customers, start doing that initial reading, maybe start coming to some, some of the many, many industry events that are out there in order to start connecting a bit yourself and then we can help you accelerate it. And Randolph from the Energy Networks Association view? Yeah, so obviously you could go directly to our members but I think the easiest way is really to go to our collaboration portal because that goes directly into the innovation uh, teams of all of the members. So you, you fill in essentially a form on that website describing your technology and, and how it's innovative and that then goes directly in into the innovation teams and then we discuss them in our meetings and say, yeah, okay, this makes sense, let's progress this. Either one member takes it or a group of them take it away and, and turn it into a project, essentially. The one thing I would say, though, is that you have to prove that your technology or app or whatever you have is innovative. So it's best to use a resource like the Ofgem website or, or our Smarter Networks portal to understand what's been done previously 
and then how your technology is new and truly is innovative. That is absolutely key because we get a lot of people who come along with the technology but actually we've seen it before and it's, you know, it's been around for years. So I, I wonder if it's worth saying in that regard that, that perhaps for each of us this approach to what we call innovative is, is maybe different. So I think for, for you, for reasons, particularly the portal you're talking about, that's a way of handing out money. And there's a, a quite strict criteria there where you will be asked perhaps some challenging questions about how what you're doing is different. And there is very much a focus on technology, right? Hardware, software. For us, coming from an off-gen point of view, sometimes people come to us because they have invented something, hardware, software, maybe they have a patent. Fantastic. But many of the other businesses coming our way are not really technology businesses. They're, they're businesses who have a new way of interacting with customers. They're businesses who have a new business model. They have some other way of doing things. They have some other reason for wanting to launch a new business. And that's absolutely fine by us. We are really agnostic as to whether or not people are coming and saying, I have a fantastic new technology that, that I invented in my lab, or whether they're coming and saying, I think that we can work with customers in a different way, or I think we've got a different commercial model that, that means that I want to start a business. So I would say for us, don't be put off if you're not, you haven't discovered something in your PhD. If you've got a business idea that, that you'd like to go ahead with, fantastic, let's, let's have a, a conversation. And just to pause, has anyone got any questions from the audience at all? Okay, if, uh, yes, sorry, can you please state your name and your organization and then pose your question, please? Oh, hello, uh, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm from New Win Out. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask, what kind of budget do you have for, for that kind of invention? And how many projects do you have at the moment uh, going on? That's an interesting question. So whereby obviously we're discussing a lot of innovation activity, what innovation budget is available in the energy sector which that innovation stimulus will support us delivering value to customers and communities. So I think Randolph, you want to kick off? <laughs> um, so so Ofgem allows us um, two innovation funding pots essentially. Uh, one is called the Network Innovation Allowance and what that actually is, I, I can't remember the exact percentage but each of the members can use a certain percentage of their revenue on innovation projects that are under five million pounds. I think it's a couple of percent, something like that. Um, so each of them can use that as a percentage of their revenue every year. The other pot, the Network Innovation Competition, that's for larger, um, larger projects essentially. And across gas and electricity, I think the pot for that is 70 million pounds a year. Yes, so I'm involved in a few other conversations, both about sources of funding that exist now and sources of funding that haven't been announced yet and therefore I can't really talk about in detail, but, but I, um, I believe will be announced quite shortly, none of which are administered directly by me, but I'm, I'm involved in the conversation. And the uh, numbers involved are very large, hundreds of millions in terms of what's available. So it's not to say that there aren't there isn't a case to be made in order to get that money. I think everybody in the sector is very keen that, um, that where money is spent, that we are obviously in times where finances in many areas of the economy are quite constrained and that if money is being spent, that it's being spent very wisely. And at the same time, I think everybody knows that in order to move to a decarbonized economy, in order to hit our environmental um, and, and consumer protection targets, big amounts of money are going to be needed and, and those amounts of money are being made available. Uh, probably one thing I'd add on as I work within the sector and I'm, I'm one of the network businesses, there's also other funding streams available such as the Innovate UK. We also, as Ukeeper Networks, we have access into the off-gem funding that Randolph described and we link into Daniel's Innovation Link um, uh, service as well. There is also um, the government body, um, Bayes, they undertake competitive um, rounds. Um, one recently was 7.75 million, looking to stimulate a market for residential demand side response, which is quite relevant to this group, at this forum, because this is whereby they're looking to try and support improved energy efficiency in buildings and supporting customers to be more flexible with their energy usage. Um, but if you want further questions, then you can contact either Randolph, Daniel and I, and we can certainly signpost you. And the Innovation Link service 
and the Energy Networks Association Smart, Smart Networks portal gives you that support and can advertise maybe routes that you may wish to go for.